morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is our first episode of Blowback, Exposing Imperial Decline for 2024. And we are honored and fortunate to have two great guests with us today. We've got John Stepling, uh, an expat from Hollywood, California, living in Norway. And we've got Ian Kummer. He is a former military communications and a public officer. affairs specialist, not an officer, no. Okay, okay. No. I was overselling In you, Moscow, man. yes. You were overselling me. <laughs> Currently residing in a Moscow suburb. And Ben Toth, my co-host, is from Pete. Page. Page. You got it last time. Page, Page in, in Hungary. Um, thank you guys for joining us. Um, I want to discuss, you know, we start off with the topic of our, our uh, the title of our episode is the Putin animal will eat you. And that is a direct quote from um, a recent Zelensky interview that he gave to, was it the uh, Financial Times? Now nah, The Economist, but it's the same. London the, and the London economy. Financial News. Yeah, The, the Economist so, did this once before when we all remarked on, give me, if you can't give us money, give me credit and, and we'll pay you back after. That was the same <laughs> outlook, the same interview. And they did it again. Okay. So uh, we'll start off with a three-minute clip of that, and then we will have a short discussion. So um, this is uh, a good three-minute clip. So uh, apparently it gets worse as it goes. So, yeah. so let's check this out. Not edited by me, I think, edited by The Economist. Enjoy. We should have sound. We have one strategy goal to occupy our territories to be on the borders of our country. Our goals didn't change. The goal is to save and to have more successful steps in the Black Sea, to continue success on Crimea, on the South. I can't tell you the details, but we will do it. And uh, to defend this, to She's save- She's trying not to, Kharkiv, not to laugh, To save Absolutely. these very important cities of Ukraine. The war, the 2024, this is the new page. This is the war not in Ukraine. Because informationally, the challenges in the Middle East, the training mission of Hamas, that, uh, that uh, pushing Arab world, the chaos in African continent. We are the part of all this war. Europe don't speak about support to Ukraine. You support you yourself giving us money or giving us weapon you support yourself ukrainians are fighting for the world that is the answer what the world has to focus and recognize many people outside ukraine are saying maybe it is time to negotiate with putin maybe it is time to start talking can you tell me categorically whether that is an option for you in 2024 or not that is not the, the, the moment of, of discussion, of uh, compromises or not compromises, because we don't ha have any fundamental uh, steps forward to the peace from Russia. We have to speak with Russian, not attack us. Anytime Russia can I attack you. Loses it. You have to be ready. Why I have such reaction? Because all their steps mean another thing. When they have discussion on conference of, uh, of uh, Putin, he said, no, we didn't get all the results. We will go forward. What does it mean? That we have to sit and say, sorry, please stop or something like this? It's not our position, this weakness. And he feel it like, like animal because he is animal and like feeling of the blood. And that's why he will feel his strongness and he will eat you, he will eat you. totally with all your EU, your NATO. NATO, freedom, democracy. Forget about it. Forget about it. That's why I don't see any, any signals about peace. I see only steps of terroristic country. And that was the, the short compressed version. I just realized who... Zelensky reminds me of while that was playing. I just sent you in the chat. It's a picture. Um, has anyone else here seen the American cartoon uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. He's, 
Yeah. Boris Padanoff. Yeah. Yes. There's a, there's a, I couldn't send the picture itself, just the link. To I it. can share it back, but yeah, I don't know the cartoon, unfortunately. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, that is Zelensky and <laughs> Anna Barbera. <clears throat> that was God Almighty. Seven. Uh, he reminded me of uh, of uh, Ike Turner and his advanced cocaine, uh, you know, meltdowns. Ike would sit there mumbling, eh, "Cocaine is a hell of a drug," and he would repeat that twelve or fourteen times. Um, uh, he just looks, he just looks addled. I mean, yeah. um, he needs, um, <clears throat> needs hospitalization would be my advice, uh, because it's just becoming, uh, I think people, people who still sponsor him in the West, they are thinking you got to shut up, just, just stick to written really press releases that, that you, we can't put this guy in front of the camera anymore. And by yeah. the way, I don't feel for his opportunism because he's an actor and he went with the banderist crowd, but I see that he sees that he's been betrayed and I can yeah. kind of understand that. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's upsetting to him. Like this is not what he was promised. And yeah, yeah he was betrayed. Get Sean Penn on the phone. Sean promised me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Rick James, Rick James and Ike Turner, those are the two guys <clears throat> that um, had serious, that same um, affect that, that Zelensky has gotten to now. I, uh, I'm reminded of Dan Aykroyd and um, his other, uh, the guy from that other actor, I forget his name, who played Roxanne. And anyway, two wild and crazy guys, you know, two wild uh, and crazy Eastern European guys. So that's what I kind of take from him. And he, he kind of says things, you know, he, 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 his English isn't that great, and so he doesn't really communicate very well what he's trying to say. And it's it's a little bit of an embarrassment um, when he's not sticking to the script. And I think they've stopped writing his scripts. They're kind of putting him out there by himself. And like you know, Scott Ritter's talked about it a lot. He's um, you know he's he's being betrayed, and and you know you can have a little yeah. empathy for him, but at the same time, I mean, he totally made his bed. He should have known better. Oh yeah, um, silly guy. But yeah. yeah, well, it's interesting that that. Uh, if you look at, at, you know, Joe Biden, Zelensky, Kamala Harris, um, before he, you know, stepped down Boris Johnson, none of these people could, could safely be put in front of a camera. I mean, Kamala Harris is stunning. I, you know, they know they can't. They try to limit her 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 interviews and she, because she talks she, she, English. She went to Vietnam to say America is back. Just imagine yeah. that. You know, about the topic of <laughs> yeah. Oh, by okay. the way, just a small uh, real okay. um, sorry twist on that because I think in recent polling, uh, when it comes to approval, Kamala has beat uh, Biden by one point. She has negative charisma, and she's higher than Biden. I don't yeah. know where exactly that's from. I read that. Biden that's is it. is <clears throat> Biden is the lowest ever in you know presidential approval ratings, and he's just bottomed out. Nobody likes him. Uh, even the people pushing for for his running again don't like him. Wish desperately there were somebody else. And it's, but it's interesting that there isn't anybody else. I mean, this is this, I I find this fascinating. Uh, the the Republicans and the, I mean, what what are we going to have? Nikki Haley versus Kamala Harris or something? I mean, who? You know, Nikki Haley's a cretin. That's that's not hyperbole. I mean, she's. I think it was George Samuel who was talking about this the other day. He said, "Oh my God!" But I mean, she really is not qualified to to have any kind of position like this. She got up the other day and she thought this was going to be a, a campaign, you know, home run, uh, and essentially said that Palestinians should be ethnically cleansed. That that they just need to be gotten rid of, yeah. gotten out of Gaza and removed. And I remember the interviewer was sitting there looking at her like, did you just say what, what I think you just said? 
you know. A former and ambassador to the UN. She should know international law, should she not? Something, yeah. I mean, it's it's extraordinary. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, I don't, I think it's, it's, it's interesting. The, the timelines for, you know, the, the proxy war in Ukraine and the timelines for this genocide in Palestine and, uh, and they're both, you know, they're both catastrophic on on multiple levels, and it's leading into the U.S. election. And I, you know, nobody, nobody knows what this election is going to look like because it's it's, uh, it's unprecedented. You know, it's just unprecedented. We've never had an incumbent in the U.S. like Joe Biden, right? Who's senile, 112 years old, infirm, zombie, and, and right. utterly corrupt, whose son is a crackhead thief, you know, uh, coke head, crackhead, uh, and and this is going to be the guy. Right? I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just weird. I'm at a loss for words. I really am. I. Um, so I don't know what what's going to play out. I think we talked about this last time I was on here, and I said Michelle Obama, eleventh hour, Michelle Obama is going to come on. Um, but uh, who knows? Blinken, that was the other guess. Was Tony Blinken's going to take his Stratocaster and make an eleventh hour appearance? I don't know. I don't I've know. got some thoughts. Uh, what do you think, Ian? Well, real quick on this, how the how Ukraine pertains to the election, and it's interesting because Billy, you mentioned this complaint of the West or the USA or NATO betraying Ukraine. And that's actually been kind of trending on social media today. I saw it on Quora and Twitter. Um, and that prompted me to look up what everybody was saying before the special military operation started. And I want to real quick pull up a quote for you. Um, this is something I wrote. It wasn't just me saying this. This was you know, everybody was saying this back in 2021. So in December 21, 2021, I said, Ukraine is teetering on the verge of becoming a failed state, making talks of it joining NATO in 20, this year, as fruitless as they were the previous year and the previous year and all the years before that. Ukraine's odds of joining the EU are even lower. And it would be a one-way relationship because Ukraine would qualify for massive amounts of EU aid and wouldn't have much offer in return. The borders would also be open. Millions of Ukrainians could come and live anywhere they wanted in the EU. Would Germans appreciate millions of Ukrainians flooding into their country, looking they for don't. jobs and social benefits? All that leaves Ukraine as little more than a chess piece to provoke the Russians. So now the West seems to enjoy deliberately creating failed states in and around Russia's fear of influence. And then the, oh, Polly, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Then the following month in January, right before the SMO started, I said, if Biden wants to, this is before they did anything, before Russia, you know, and I said this and everybody's saying this, if Biden wants to deter Russia from invading Ukraine, the most sensible place to deploy troops is in Ukraine. It would be a meaningful gesture with real consequences because Russia could not occupy Ukraine without firing on Americans. But Biden didn't do that because he doesn't actually want war with Russia. The American no. plan appears to be to leave Ukraine a broken quagmire for Russia to clean up. That was out there. Yeah. Everybody was that saying was that before anything quote. happened. Yeah. Yes. So a broken it's true. quagmire that's going to be Russia's problem and a drag on their economy and not the EU economy. So saying it was betrayed, everybody was telling Ukraine before anything happened and they didn't want to listen. And now two years later, they're starting to wake up to it, maybe. But I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. It's, <clears throat> it's, it's, the thing is, I remember when, when, this whole thing jumped off the first couple of months uh, of, of the propaganda uh, 
apparatus of the U.S. was cranking out stuff. This was the, you know, visits from celebrities and whatnot. And I remember I posted a number of things on social media uh, and, and I was just attacked. Like I had to block tons of people that, that were former students and um, from, from the Polish film school. And, you know, these are people I liked and, and uh, but, but they had just, they had, you know, they drank the Kool-Aid, they were energized to, to, uh, to look at somehow, the, and I kept, that this was a unnecessary uh, war to fight off Russian aggression. And I kept saying, okay, it's not really Russian aggression. And do you know anything about the people in charge in Kiev? I mean, do you have any, any like historical grasp of, of Bandera and the nationalists, the Nazis, the Azov battalion, all of these people? I mean, let's just have a discussion about that. But but you couldn't do it. You couldn't have no, those discussions. Un, unprovoked aggression. There is no further history. That was the mantra uh, last right. century. Yeah. Right. Well, and so, but you're seeing the same thing with Gaza. The world was created anew October 7th, as if there were not, you know, 70 years uh, preceding that. There is a great uh, interview with Norman Finkelstein, uh, very interesting interview, uh, conducted by Russell Brand. And, um, and Brand is doing backflips and pirouettes to make sure YouTube is not going to boot him off uh, his channel. And he keeps saying, I don't want, I'm just, you know, we're just putting things out. I'm just trying to get to the truth. I'm not... And Finkelstein goes along with it and says, okay, but, you know, and, he, and he, he lays out a short history, a short timeline of uh, <clears throat> the siege of Gaza that, that for the last 12 years. And, and it's, a, it's a, just that first half hour is absolutely worth watching because... Finkelstein says, look, this, this Israel can shut off their water. They prevent them from leaving. They shut off food supply. They shut off electricity and internet when they feel like it frequently. Uh, they have absolute and total control over this population. And what do you expect? is going to happen, you know? Um, and the second thing, and this is a personal, um, what's the word, pet peeve of mine or something, uh, because the, the, the Israeli trolls that you run into on social media, the influencers, all of these people are constantly going, but, this shocking, horrific acts, these atrocities, these unimaginable um, sadistic attacks on October 7th from Hamas. And you say, yeah, okay. Is there any independent verification of this besides you guys saying they're unimaginable and unspeak? Because Hamas gave, gave a very dignified and emphatic statement saying, that's not true. That didn't happen. Provide the evidence. Provide the now, evidence. You're going to say this shit. Provide the evidence. And of course they can't. You know, Most they people would say, at, at this point, they would say you're anti-Semitic for questioning them. Yeah. Well, that that is how that goes. It's horrific. By the way, all the articles, even to this day, they have to begin with this sort of prequel of the worst attack ever since World War II. Uh, on on the Jewish yeah. people. That's what ten seven is. Yeah, they got to yeah, bring I up mean, the Holocaust. You don't care about ten eight, ten nine, ten ten, ten eleven. It's all ten seven. The, the, the seven. Or ten six, or ten <laughs> five, or ten or that. four. <laughs> you can go for decades. Well, yeah. you know, Finkelstein notes that this uh, incursion uh, by the IDF is probably the worst. The bombing is the worst ever, but it is not the only incursion. And over the last 12 years, there's been something like 
12, 13 incursions and bombings of Gaza. They just don't even make the news. There was like fatigue from the media. They don't cover it. It's constant. These people are constantly under assault uh, and, and subject to, to these arbitrary uh, abuses like having their water cut off. So uh, it, it's extraordinary. I, it's extraordinary. And, and I will mention one other thing that people should look up. I mean, last time we talked about a little bit about David Sheen's um, lecture, Kahanistan, about the Meyer Kahana parties, the settler parties that have so much influence now. I think it was here that that was talked about. Anyway, uh, if you don't know that lecture, by all means, look it up. But he did a, a really almost more telling lecture five years ago called, uh, uh, oh, I can't remember, but it's something like tracking the dynamics of Israeli politics, tracking the various parties and, and how they've come to have influence and what they stand for and so forth. A, a and, video lecture people can find on yeah, YouTube. It's a, it's a, yeah, you can find it on for sure, Vimeo, but I think it may be on YouTube too. Who, who I mean, is this was David Sheen. Okay. S H double E N. Uh, and and you know, this is this is the Israeli politicians in their own words. Uh, you know, and uh, the settlers are are insane they're fanatics they're the they're the zionist dash so you know. anyway yeah yeah uh, i i did not i appreciate russell brand i did not see the episode that he had norm on norman finkelstein so yeah that's that's um i'm gonna definitely check that out and then david sheen's um five years ago the trajectory of israeli um politics kind politics. of thing. But, but Zionism, party. you know, to, to, to say that, you know, the settlers are the are the ISIS of Zionism. I mean, that's absolutely true. And Zionism already is just such an odious, racist, disgusting ideology. Uh, and then to have the worst of the worst of those people in charge is literally what we've got going on right now in Israel. Yeah, there's there's um, I'm going to look up something. Um, this is the. Uh, Palestine Advocacy Project. It's just a single page of Israeli leaders in their own words. Yeah, you just have to collect them. It's I think I've seen yeah. this. Yeah, and and just just read them and get back to me. Yeah, you know. we're fighting so human. The, uh, the Palestine Advocacy Project. Yeah. So Google that. Um, uh, what was uh, okay? So the gray zone. Oh, uh, talking about October 7th, like the gray zone's done some great work exposing the lies of the beheaded babies, the, um, uh, you know, the rapes, the gang rapes and, and all that stuff. Um, and we want to talk about the, the outright, you know, a uh, propaganda offensive that, you know, we're being inundated with, uh, after October 7th, just to build that up as like the new Holocaust to justify really the you know the mass expulsion of gaza the creation of greater israel or you know steps towards that end um what you know this non-stop blitz and so we already kind of mentioned it right we said that it's obligatory for them to to utilize the word holocaust whenever they bring up october 7th yeah. it's the worst attack right. since the holocaust um right. well <clears throat> the um the the uh, I mean a number of people a number of commentators uh, Miko Pellet who has you know Miko's interesting because a dozen years ago he was wrote his book The General's Son and he comes from Israeli aristocracy I think we talked about this uh, his father was a famous general in the IDF and as a little boy he you know all the most famous Israeli soldiers were at the breakfast table chatting with his dad and, and his sister went to school with Netanyahu. He's very intimate with the whole thing. So 12 years ago, he would give these lectures that were beautiful and very dignified. And, and he would talk about the evolution of his consciousness 
with regard to Palestine. You talk about how ashamed his mother felt when she would pass women in the street who were Palestinian, who she knew as a little girl, and their houses had now been stolen. But he was nothing if not even tempered. And he just now, he's at the end of his rope. You can see it. I mean, he's aged, number one. <laughs> But he's so frustrated. He he, you know, he's he he doesn't. He's had a number of debates, and he he's great. I mean, he's great, but he is not the same guy as twelve years ago. He's much angrier now, and frustrated. And and he used to be the two state solution guy, twelve fifteen years ago, and now his position is end Zionism. Absolutely, yeah. end it. No one has progressed through that letter faster, I think, than Scott Ritter, who, who was uh, from a full, uh, you know, Israel, the Zionist fanboy, to uh, no, the two-state solution has been betrayed for too many years. And I think he's right. By the way, when you mention a bit of that, you know, frustration, I totally understand it. And you can see it also on Norm, Norman Finkelstein. He's been yes. in this fight for most his life. And it's yeah. just, you know, it's just no one has listened so far. But I do see some hope. I don't know if you've seen some videos from uh, Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, the, the people yes. are out in enormous numbers. There is now an official case uh, at the ICJ initiated by South Africa against Israel for war crimes, for uh, based on the war crimes, uh, whatever the document is. And it's now being co-sponsored by Malaysia. And apparently, uh, I just uh, saw this on Reuters, that Israel actually wants um, that douchebag Dershowitz uh, for legal defense at the 11th of January. So another, what, more than a week away sometime next yeah, week. Dershowitz does not want Jeffrey Epstein brought up in any discussion. Right. That's for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah I saw that. This is stuff that, that never that, happened before, you know? Yeah. That protest in uh, in Turkey, in Istanbul, they it's very impressive. That bridge, they unfurled a banner the entire yeah. length of the bridge with Palestinian flag and messages. And the message read, the world can be a beautiful place if America wasn't in it. Oh, yeah. Right. Fucking right on. You know, so that the was issue, example. the wow. problem now is the food more than anything else. Because you have, because almost 100% of the population is experiencing some degree of hunger. And now when yeah. it comes to malnutrition, a human population can last almost indefinitely. Uh, you know, when, just, when there's just malnutrition, you know, it doesn't do good things to you, but it's indefinite. But at some point when the food completely runs out, you have actual starvation, that's when you're going to see deaths skyrocket. And, that, and I don't think there's an exact way to know for sure, but with UN observers and everybody else on the ground saying it's a crisis level. And, you know, and the problem is that bringing in food after food has already run out is still going to have a high number of deaths because of distribution. So it's great that we see protests and all that. But Do you, unless actual states, unless the Arab states, unless somebody takes well, actual is, action. Yeah, this is this is the big question, isn't it? And and. If you go back to the PFLP days, right, and and um, the the radicals who who ran that, not just Arafat but Leila Kadani and whatnot, and listen to their lectures. These are forty years old now, um, but they point out that, and Norman Finkelstein points this out all the time that. Israel had a policy of letting in just enough food to keep Palestinians in Gaza alive, just enough. And sometimes just enough and a little more. They actually calculated the caloric intake that would keep Palestinians alive. For we, years, for decades. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is crazy that this is good. I don't know what to say to people. Just that fact alone should should make people um, 
should horrify people. Do you want to and, hear something that will definitely uh, anger you? And I don't remember, I, I read a lot of this, where exactly it was. It was like, you read the article and at the end of it, there's a little very important bit. And it wasn't Haaretz, like not a lefty thing, but maybe uh, Times of Israel, or maybe the Jerusalem Post, somewhere there, that apparently the for Biden to come along uh, uh, to Tel Aviv, the concession prize was, uh, basically the price for it was, we have to let some aid in, you know? So Netanyahu lied some aid in, basically to get the bobblehead to, to come over here and show his, show his support. That was the price on it, you know? A lot less than previously went in there, and then it all stopped again. And now, of course, the UN is reporting, as Ian said, that half of the people in Gaza are starving. And by the way, the worst year for children in the West Bank, not in Gaza, that that's been leveled. I mean, it's absolutely horrific. And a lot of these things are coming out. But that that little bit uh, about, you know, Biden, I'll, I'll let some aid in if you just come over here and shake my hand. And no. you can just do that. Well, calculating um, the caloric intake of entire populations is literally, it's not an exaggeration, it is literally what Nazi Germany did. Yeah, literally. it's exactly so, literally what the yeah. Nazis did. It's thinking like a Nazi. Uh, and I don't know what to say. If somebody wants to debate that, I'm happy to do so because I don't know what defense anybody can mount for what Israel is doing, what Zionism is doing, um, and what Palestinians have endured over the last 15 years is is unimaginable. It just, you know, um, the world didn't start on October 7th, you know, um, and, and uh, it'll be interesting uh, what happens with the South African case. They invoked the genocide whatever it is, legal mechanism yeah. to start proceedings. Um, you know, it, at the end of the day, <clears throat> Israel uh, will just say, fuck off. You know, Likely, because, yeah. Because what are you going to do? You know, Netanyahu's position, what are you going to do? You know, we got the United States over here, you know, so yeah. fuck off. That's, that's their position. But... Uh, I am not the only one, pretty much, you know, everybody who who has been a, a spokesman for the Palestinians has said uh, Israel can't survive doing this and Zionism can't survive. You simply cannot in 2024 now, uh, you can't have a colonial project, an apartheid state. You can't do it. And it it's not sustainable, and I don't think it is. I think, I think, um, you know, but this brings up the Arab states again, because uh, Hussein of Jordan, uh, Sisi in Egypt, both have directly helped Israel by shooting down drones uh, that were coming into to that city on Port City Eilat. Uh, and so, you know, this is, this is a big topic. Uh, the Arab ruling class, as Leila Kadani said, uh, they are always going to side with with their patrons in the West. They are always going to do that's how they stay in power. You know, nobody nobody wants them in power uh, unless unless they they have protection, and they do. So there you go. But but there are long term, I think, implications for this. Uh, I think, um, I mean, this comes from VK, from Russian social media, but it kind of made viral on X Twitter, other places, that uh, Putin intervened uh, against 50 NATO nations to save the people of the Donbass, and 1.3 or 4 billion Arabs didn't lift a finger to save uh, the Palestinians, except for, you know, Ansar Allah, PIJ, Hezbollah, uh, and Hamas. So um, these little resistance uh, forces, but that really is uh, shameful. Um, yeah, hopefully yeah. they should feel shamed. I mean, <clears throat> what you would have to do if your CC is just lock down the Suez, immediate economic uh, blockade, meaning worldwide economic, uh, you know, reverberations. And nope, didn't do it. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. And now very vulnerable. You know, they're very vulnerable. Yeah. Look at look at the damage that uh, and Surala and Surala. Uh, the Yemeni uh, pirates, as it were, uh, look at the damage they've done 
in in the last few weeks. Uh, billions of dollars. Have, it's cost Israel billions of dollars. Uh, insurance rates go up on shipping. They have to take that other route. A number of, of big shipping companies have stopped shipping. They just, we're not going to do it until it's safe. It's not safe. Uh, and, and the U.S. intervened. This is an interesting, however you want to look at it, but an interesting sidebar is that uh, the Yemeni uh, uh, resistance didn't kill a single person in all these capturing of ships. They had a party on one ship, which I really like. The Galaxy and, Leader, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. It's like a, it's it's traction like, now. Yeah, it's just great. And the U.S. enters the discussion and brings death. Not diplomacy, death. Death, yeah, because that's what they do. No diplomacy, they immediately, suddenly there are fatalities because the U.S. is there. there you know. Well, NATO is just as complicit as Israel itself because Israel is not the U.S.A. Israel is not Russia. It's not even South Korea. It's Israel. They don't have the stockpiles or industry to maintain this war. It's only reason it is happening is because Europe, the United Kingdom, USA all give them an unlimited whatever they want. Like 200 tons. And weapons. Yes. Yeah. Whatever yeah. it is. They could, it wouldn't even be a choice. They just could not prosecute the war in the absence of foreign support. So those countries are all just as complicit as there is also. Apparently, I think we uh, talked with this uh, with John just before the show. They're, they're suffering some really serious losses. I mean, when I looked, first looked up the Golani Brigade, it's supposedly the SAS, the Absolute Special Forces Super Super Elite. They're being pulled out from Gaza. Another couple of these brigades are being pulled out from Gaza. You know, get back. To, uh, it's it looks really heavy. Not much makes it out by way of leaks, but I've also seen a few of those. I mean, uh, big um, manpower and uh, hardware losses. I mean, those. Uh, Merkava tanks, the undefeatables. Well, a lot of them are burning. You know, a lot of them are burning. <coughs> well, it, <coughs> it's interesting if you look at Ukraine and you look at <coughs> Israel. Uh, the U.S. offloaded a lot of junk to Ukraine, right? A lot of outdated uh, weapon systems, a lot of... Uh, old uh, missiles and there are theories that some of the misfires are because the fuel is old and uh, and unreliable now uh, unstable so they gave them a lot of junk <clears throat> they gave them a lot of money what i don't know what that goes into Zelensky's suitcase i don't know but but they're being very careful not to to do any that's going to actually piss off Russia. They they don't want a war with Russia, and Putin has been you know, I mean very very smart about it all. And um, and then you have Israel who doesn't have a tax base that could sustain their country for more than a week if the U.S. stopped sending aid. They they don't like you said they don't have. Um, the industry to make these weapons, to crank up the out, they don't have it. And they are entirely a sort of fake country uh, protectorate of the U.S. And that's what they, that's what they are. All these kind of accoutrements and, and uh, bells and whistles, uh, uh, the only democracy in the Middle East and all of this stuff. And, and you know, doesn't, change the fact that Israel is in a very, very precarious position. And, and Netanyahu made a deal with these uh, settler parties that almost assuredly at this point he regrets uh, because Ben Gavir uh, is, is constantly threatening to pull out, break up the coalition if Netanyahu were to call a ceasefire or stop or let aid in. Uh, his his government would fall apart. So, what you know, he can't do it because his government falls apart. He leaves power. He probably goes to jail. There's, yes, there's, there's cases there waiting. So uh, he's he's doing everything he can to stay in power. 
Um, but he can't really give Ben Gavir what he wants, which is greater Israel. I mean, Gavir has said stuff like, we want to expand and take over the southern half of Lebanon. We wanted to, you know, we want to include Syria in the greater. I mean, these crazy ideas that are not going to happen. And and the only person who doesn't seem to know they are crazy is is Ben Gavir and his party, Smollett and all those guys. Uh, it's a strange situation, which is why David Sheen's uh, lecture is so good, the one from five years ago. You know, I wonder if uh, privately who feels more trapped, you know, Zelensky or uh, Netanyahu and his ilk. Uh, Galan, Ben Gavir, um, that guy, uh, the, the guy with the ears, Hagari, uh, I think he's the one who said this is going to last throughout 2024, but, you know, less uh, less intensively. So I'm kind of listening to Blinken, but it's going to last throughout the fucking year. You already said that. Yeah. No, no it's yeah, how, <clears throat> how, much, how much pressure can Sisi and um, Abdullah yeah. and Jordan, uh, how much can they accept? Because at a certain point, they're not going to be able to survive if Israel just continues to do the, the stuff they're doing. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> well, this, this is. Go ahead, John. No, no. I was saying this is really the point. Yeah, exactly. Well, I don't know um, if you've heard the latest uh, from the Israeli press. It was already leaked. Well, kind of leaked, but you know, admitted because they speak openly that we got uh, old um, uh, shit. Um, it, the British guy with the ears, you know, uh, Iraq Iran war. That, that guy. Uh, I'm yeah. just going uh, to. Tony Blair. They, yeah. they, they enlisted. It's, it's, ba it's basically explicit uh, that they enlisted this guy yeah. to get uh, the Gazan people settled in other parts of the world. So he's going to basically lobby European nations and maybe other Americans. Come on, take take these guys in, because the one thing that uh, both uh, you know the um, Egypt, because that's where the Gazans would go uh, onto the um, the Sinai Peninsula, and yeah. Jordan, which is where the um, uh, West Bank people would go. They said no. That is that is an act of war, and we will we will take yeah. it as such. That was the one red line that they said no. So now they bring in Tony Bloody Blair to kind of okay, let's do ethnic cleansing. The definition of ethnic cleansing, and they will have. By the way, I've seen adverts. We can have some these new beach resorts that can be built there now. For the yeah, oh, that's adverts. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Did you see those? It's yeah. Extraordinary. One of the adverts was. Uh, pictures of Gaza, the background, Gaza destroyed. Right? Yeah, the flat one, the current Gaza. Yeah, yeah, the current Gaza. And stenciled over it were condos. And yeah. the, the copy read in, in Hebrew, but was translated, uh, your dream of beachfront property doesn't have to be a dream anymore. Openly. 10,000 dead children, crazy. but don't it's let crazy. that get in the way of your dream. Um, yeah, extraordinary, extraordinary. Same uh, number of cancer was, patients yeah. with no access to medicine or power. It's just it's ri ridiculous. Yeah. I want to say I saw a picture of Gaza prior 1948, and it looked great. Like It looked like a great resort city. Uh, we all heard that Lebanon used to be you know, the mecca of you know, European... Um, vacations and european tourism and and that looked like what it looked like in gaza that beach was a, just a bustling um you know tourist tourist hub but um so yeah of course israel would love to um you know ethnically cleanse everyone and you know take take it over and put in some apartments for settlers right there on the beach of course but is that possible i mean is is can can the government in egypt sign off on that without getting overthrown can the government in jordan do the same thing um the turks are obviously going to oppose that so i you know i don't think it's possible i think i think they're delusional i mean i think that's what's going on it's a delusion um and reality is going to hit them in 2024 i mean you know we're gonna we're gonna see how it plays out but they, that can't possibly be the, the result um, I had a bunch yeah. to say about domestic politics and stuff like that, but I don't want to change the subject to that. 
if we have other things. Yeah. Before no, no. We, I, I mean, I, yeah, go ahead. I, I mean, before I we switched, j just in the area, two pieces of news since, uh, well, the last, the new year. Uh, one was the largest aircraft carrier in the world, which is the way, way they have to say it uh, every time. It's not the Ike, it's the other one. Uh, the Gerald Ford. Ford. Is it the Ford? It's the Gerald Ford, yeah, is heading back to Norfolk. So one of the two uh, is uh, going back home. And at the same time, uh, a small flotilla of Iranian warships are entering the, the Red Sea through Bab el -Mandeb. So it doesn't look like Operati uh, Operation Prosperity Guardian did much because uh, the first one to sign up was the Danish shipping company, Maersk to yes. uh, do the okay like, like okay now now you can accompany us all the way now nah, sorry too dangerous and they fucked off again they paused up all operations again saying now nah, this doesn't uh, really work for us so that just because johnny houthi was uh, brave in you know sandals little boats a uh, couple of homemade rockets uh, they they wrecked that shipping lane to hell and now yeah. the us at least half of it is exiting and iran is saying well we're just going to park park ourselves right here that's that situation seems to be changing and it looks like all of it was to me it looks like with sans diplomacy what you do is big threats but then you can't follow through except you know people like john right. bolton still write opeds we should directly uh you know attack uh iran lindsey graham. Lindsey graham. lindsey's the other guy those are the two yeah bolton and graham lindsey are now graham the two. Said, blow iran off the map yeah it's 90 million people lindsey um uh, you know is your moral compass maybe open? Who make uh, the best uh, defensive concrete in the world, meaning even your bunker busters won't work. And a lot of that drone production, that missile production is underground. They've been preparing for this since the revolution. They knew who, know who the U.S. Yeah. is, the only local state that knows who the U.S. is. Sorry. The tunnel uh, building is an amazing achievement. I mean, if you've actually seen any of the footage, they don't let much out, but... Well, Hamas um, does do amazing. some pizza videos. Yeah, some amazing. Videos. I mean, really quite a feat. Uh, but no, and, you know, Tony Blair, war criminal, is going to say what to people? What is the carrot he's going to dangle in, in front of Germany or Sweden? Or so? um, I can't imagine anybody any government in the eu wants anything to do with this i you know norway here is facing uh the for the first time since for 100 years um an economic downturn where the quality of life has gone down for most norwegians Sweden this was too. kind of unthinkable 20 years ago uh and and energy prices are through the roof i mean you have no idea um and it's going to be minus 18 all week uh and and uh food prices food prices uh <clears throat> are are higher than i've ever seen them here and i've been here 15 years but um uh the the administration the last two governments in norway uh, have been utterly corrupt utterly and this is another sort of scandal uh that doesn't draw any attention outside of norway but you have a very big erna solberg's husband did all this insider trading during the pandemic uh and she said gosh i i didn't, I didn't know he was doing that i'm sorry <laughs> and and pandemic still, is this very rich West Oslo uh, Mandarin who heads the Labour Party shockingly uh, just keeps throwing my whatever the U.S. says he goes along with and they're building two enormous uh, military bases in the north of Norway pristine countryside in the north of Norway. Uh, People, it's starting to dawn on people, maybe this isn't a good idea, uh, destroying the, you know, this perfect, one of the last perfect pristine wildernesses um, in the world, probably, and they're going to fuck it up. Uh, so, and, and, he, and he keeps signing away money to Ukraine as well, as these prices keep going higher. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff uh, a lot of moving parts right now here in Norway. But anyway, that, yeah. Negative 18. That, that's pretty cool. Here, so, uh, <clears throat> so I say, 
to see that that comment Spanish Favs just yeah. now said, um, I would say poignant. it's well, yes, and I think because you know, you know, especially here in the USA, we've heard about this for decades. You know, this very you know how European countries are all better than us. They they've been saying that to us for decades. You know, we've got this high standard of li of living. We have democratic socialism. We have very, very, very good social safety nets and welfare systems and high entrepreneurship to go with it. But that was only possible for three reasons. One reason was importing cheap Russian energy, exporting defense obligations to the USA so they can have very low defense budgets. And three is China. free resource, almost free resources from the global south. All three of those things are at yeah. speed. Sorry, the fourth pillar is having access to the largest uh, market in the world, which is China. And that is also something they're trying to chop off. Which <laughs> oh, I don't yes. know that's the definition of stupidity right now. But you're right. Yes. You're absolutely right. And the, the quote was, what I loved is, instead of having cheap resources, they wanted it for free. That's what I found very poignant about. Because that's what this whole fucking operation uh, well, really Germany in, you know, uh, 1990s again let's loot russia dry let's have some drunkard in charge maybe break it up into yeah. five constituent yeah. republics. Yeah. that was germany in 1941 because they had because germany at that point did not have two and the axis powers did not have a two-front war as of 1941 they had i think at some point they had painted themselves into a corner realizing that you know churchill and roosevelt were not just going to make peace so they were kind of stuck with this lingering standoff at the channel but they had a non-aggression pact with the soviet union getting resources they were okay at that point but it would be they realized it would be better to have those resources for free yep and the rest is history and, and they had a united continental europe and they do yes. this every bloody hundred years like they did in well, same with napoleon same with yeah. napoleon united yeah. continent again it's yeah. just no, and it's you know in in terms of Norway, it is a it is a shame because you're talking about probably the best healthcare system in the world. I mean, I can testify to this, um, or because if it weren't, if I were in the U.S., I'd I'd be dead. Um, uh, it's remarkable. It is the highest standards imaginable, and it's all free. Uh, um, it, it, that's about to change. I'm thinking that's a trend that um, they don't they don't like it. <clears throat> they don't want to export it. They want to get rid of it. Um, yeah, you know, yeah neoliberalism. Same same as in Britain, the NHS so, so being yeah. sold off bit by bit and being privatized. By the way, John, just the contrast: Eastern European nations. We've been in the EU for about 20 years, a recent uh, anniversary. And we were told all these things. We would have the same health care as in Norway. We would have the same retirement money as uh, the Spanish people. We would have these, these beautiful, we, we would vacation in Paris every other month. And we stayed the same for 20 years. For us, it was an empty lie that we would become the same yeah. as the Scandinavian welfare states, you know. It was a big, well, a big here's, here's, I will tell you a very quick little story about mm -hmm. Norway that I think is symptomatic in Norway. Um, I had a, a medical problem, relatively serious, and it was okay, and I got treated, and the treatment went on for a few weeks, and I had a hospital stay down in Oslo, actually, and uh, I did driving back and forth. I was living outside Oslo then, so I drove from Grua into Oslo and back a number of times, and then it got taken care of. <clears throat> all free, and I was given a clean bill of health, and that was that. Then uh, about six weeks later, I got a letter in the mail uh, from the Norwegian government and through the health services, Helsingorg. And I went, huh, what's this? So I opened it up, and it was a check. <laughs> it was a check for about the equivalent of $300. And I thought, what did, what did you get what is this? So I asked my wife, I said, can you translate? What, what is this? She said, oh, oh, yeah, no, they're reimbursing you for your gas driving to and from <laughs> the doctor. That's, 
That's my anecdote. When I was a kid in the People's Republic of Hungary, in a big hospital unit, there was a cashier place. And I asked mom and dad, what the fuck is that for? We don't pay for medicine for treatment. I said, that's to reimburse you in case you're yeah. <laughs> No, but it's from, you know, from those times. I, I yes. learned it as an adult from mom and dad. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was to reimburse you if you had to travel there. And yeah. all of that in 1989 was gone. Not as instantly, not as painfully as in Russia, but bit by bit, slowly eroded, okay. taken away. You know, I mean, lake, lake Balaton, the biggest lake in Hungary. A lot of Germans, a lot of. I love that lake, by the way. Can I just say that? Of it's course. A beautiful okay. lake. It's a, yeah, it's, I've always tried to talk my wife into a vacation um, at Balaton because I really like it. I passed through once. Anyway. Thank you. Yeah. It makes me proud. What I was about to say was it was surrounded by resorts. So different workers resorts. My granddad was a miner. So he went to the miners resort. My daddy, my dad worked in uh, education of medicine. So there was the local universities resorts. And of course, big health resorts, uh, you know, uh, world standard heart, cent heart centers, lung centers, all of that. And it's slowly over the last 30 years has become basically a private swimming pool with some wine attached to it, because there's also nice yeah. wallet on wine. Well, <laughs> even in Poland, I lived in Poland for- yeah, That's true, years. thank you. Um, because I because I taught at the Polish National Film School, and so I was locked into the Polish economy. And <clears throat> I remember I was teaching a class one day, and we were talking about, so I forget what, and the student said, oh, you know, I love boating, I love sailing. I know a lot of my train learn sailing as a young boy and uh, but now i can't do it i said why he goes well we used to go up to the missourian lakes in summer and the communist uh youth camp would give us boats and we'd go sailing all summer and he goes now i go up the best i can do is to clean the boats for the rich people that come and sail <laughs> the lake. that's the anecdote isn't it Pioneer boats, I think they must have been. Yeah, yeah. Um, and By the way, we, we, we sometimes call them our uh, Kurvatic brothers because that's the one word we absolutely share is, is the word Kurva, which doesn't mean, you know, a turn <laughs> like it does in Italy. It, it means something bad. Yeah, yeah. It's our cultural. Brother. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's fascinating, actually. Um, but it's it's very hard to explain some of these things to Americans, you know, because I get the impression they just don't believe you. They just think that's not possible. You know? um, so imagine what they think of Russia, especially never oh, having been there, you know. Yeah. Today, I shared a post online on social media um, saying that, you know, Russia has a higher home ownership rate than the USA, half the prison population per capita, double the police force per capita, and just lift it off. He's just and the response is people just don't believe it. They say no, and even though these are not, these aren't even yeah, disputed right. facts. They're just well, impossible. I saw a tweet the other day, uh, <clears throat> and the story was about um, the Ansarula capturing a couple of ships in the Red Sea, and 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 that the U.S. was sending in a flotilla operation, um, you know, whatever it is, something prosperity. And the tweet was, well, the Arabs are now going to learn why the United States doesn't have free health care. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, yeah. Which is funny because we ended up, now we have, we used to have an effective you know, global military presence and no health care. Now we have no health care and no effective global yeah. presence. It the, is step by that. step getting to that point. I just want yes. to say that in the British media, which I've always found the most uh, vicious when it comes to Russia, you know, the most anti-commie back in the day and anti-Russia in modern times, as it, you just, it just took a stretch for everything to come out. And because there's elections and Navalny disappeared for about a week and then he was he, he appeared somewhere in, in Siberia, you know, and it was uh, his, his, his adventures in the Gulag system. And I was OK, the Gulag system is back. That's that's cool. In in the minds of Britons. Uh, OK, yeah. I, yeah. I thought it was it ended in the 60s. But, you know, what do I fucking know? <laughs> it's back. All of these these tropes are going to be back. Man. Yeah, no, they are. They're coming back. It's They're totally put, unhinged from reality, all of it. It's just this week, if something is about Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping, it has to have the word tyrant in the title. 
it has to. It's like a, a rule now uh, in British media. John, yeah. one of our guests has a, a direct question here. Uh, have you heard of the Dutch cybersecurity expert Arjen Campheus, who disappeared in August 2018 while on holiday in Norway? Um, yes, I've heard of him. I don't know much about that story. Uh, <clears throat> so far as I know, he was never found. I should ask my wife because she's much more uh, up to speed on, on Norwegian news. But um, yeah, I, and 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 but there've been a couple of strange cases up here, um, and and that's the most uh, famous one. But I'm afraid I I don't know anything about it to be honest. Oh. So, you know, we will definitely have you back at some point and we can, uh, Polly watches every show so she can, uh, she can find out what you learned, uh, maybe next time you come on. Did you want to, did you, did you want to talk about, um, your, your, um, more recent experience with the Norway healthcare system or would you rather not? No, that's okay. I, but, but yeah, I mean, this is funny in a certain kind of way. Um, I was at a chess tournament. I'm a like decent club player, you know? Um, and chess is very popular here because of Magnus. And um, I, I, it's funny because I had won the Friday night game and I was playing a guy who was rated much higher than me Saturday morning. And uh, I just remember we were maybe move 15. And I just remember starting to reach for a piece and getting dizzy. And that's all I remember. And I woke up in an ambulance uh, on the way to the hospital, and they had, you know, shocked me back to life. The story was there was a chess playing doctor two chairs down who rushed over and did well, whatever you're supposed to do to somebody whose heart stopped. So I was dead for two minutes and uh, brought me back to life, sent me into Trondheim. There's a very famous teaching hospital, terrific hospital in Trondheim with a big heart department. And I was there for three weeks and they put a, a device, you know, a, uh, like an ICD. It's slightly different. It's a defibrillator, an ICD and something else. But the other part of the story is that across the street from the tournament was a hospital. So I had this extraordinary luck of having a chess playing doctor, two chairs down, a hospital like literally across the street. So the ambulance got to me in like a hot second and they rushed me to Trondheim and they did all of this stuff, ran eight gajillion tests, put a device in. I have an app for my heart. And uh, there's an app for that too. <laughs> they, they they fucked up my tattoo, actually, and uh, and it's all free, of course, you know. And the follow up stuff is Amazing. extraordinary Amazing. and very thorough, and um, and the the quality of care. I was there for like I say, like a two and a half weeks, I guess, in the hospital. Uh, great food, extraordinary doctors, teaching hospitals, so students were coming in all the time to talk to me about what happened. And, all of this stuff, and um, and now I'm back home and uh, and apparently fine, uh, but you know, so I was very lucky, even being in Norway. But if I had been in the U.S., I'd be dead. You know, yes, yeah, you'd be dead, and your and your uh, relatives would get a huge bill of probably hundreds of thousands bill. of dollars. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, someone shared with me a clip from this movie, uh, Tom Hanks, uh, a, a man named Otto or something like that. And someone falls down on the on the rails in America. And as usual, it's, of course, a movie, but it's everybody was like selfieing and uh, taking taking videos. And what the fuck is wrong with this generation? And he goes mm -hmm. to help someone out. And uh, I'm just glad that you had someone who took the Hippocratic Oath because immediately yeah. you have to have someone in need. Um now, I just want to say I'm so positively surprised because 30 years of capitalism haven't made Hungary heartless because a couple of months back there was a, a similar event. I had slug the pub tied to me and uh, an old lady collapsed in the middle of the road with, with sort of high traffic. I darted out even with the pug attached and I was the fourth or fifth to arrive. Everybody instantly stopped, uh, dropped everything and went there. It's like a reflex. It didn't die out. I was so... I was so proud, you know, that uh, we we didn't become yeah. these these zombified yeah. 
horrific creatures. Just my choice. no. It's it's these things remind me. I should temper criticism of Norway, you know, because after all, uh, they kept me alive, and uh, my boys are very happy about that. So, but yeah, let's do this again. Uh, yeah, we're we're thankful too. Uh, we appreciate you, uh, your your expertise and your and your analysis. Um, did we did we want to take on more topics, or did you need to go, John? Because I know we're we're over well, an I hour need to, already. Yeah, I, need, I need to go. Um, okay. those boys, in fact, need to get put yeah. to bed. We uh, we appreciate and, uh, your time. Uh, we will we'll have you back. Pleasure. Yeah, please do. It's been great, like always. And I'm going to leave you now if okay. I can figure out how to do this. Here, I'll, Let's I'm going to pop you out. I'll pop you out right now. Okay, he popped himself out. All right, All right guys. Um, did, did we want to discuss uh, anything else? I mean, we can talk about domestic politics. It's interesting. Uh, he, I mean, as far as, you know, who the front runner is going to be from the Democratic side, it seems that um, the governor of California is going to be the guy. I mean, they just put him in a debate with... Some? DeSantis. Yeah. Newsom was in a debate recently with DeSantis and okay. like, there's no reason for that because Newsom hasn't even declared his candidacy, but I watched the debate and I mean, he carried himself very well. Like he's ready for prime time, like in a way that, um, you know, Biden is not Kamala is not. So I think they found their guy. Like, I don't think it's even close like nobody else. My question is why would somebody like Gavin want to be the puppet at a time like this when, you know, he's going to have to make a lot of difficult decisions. Um, and, you know, with the empire declining, like who would even want to have to oversee that? Um, oh, so it's like it's like winning the lottery. It's like winning the lottery. He's probably I mean, that's like because now look at Obama, look at Bush, even look at Trump, even look at Trump. You know, you come even if no one likes you. Doesn't matter how bad you did. Does not matter. You could you get I'm once you like leave the presidency, you are set. For life. Look yeah. at Obama. I mean, I mean, Europeans still treat Obama like he's the president. Yeah, like I see it. He goes they treat him like royalty. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So you're set. Doesn't matter how bad it is or what he does. So it's it's he's in set. your own personal financial interest. I can understand that. And I mean, it's the pinnacle of your career. Like you're not gonna, you know, have a better thing on your resume than you know, president of the United States. No. At <laughs> least, at least at this point. I mean, after the collapse, hopefully people will not think that's such a great thing. To to do anymore but um we'll see I, i'm glad that hillary isn't out of the woodworks and running because i saw a short clip from her circulating but it was all about we have to do something about climate change so at least she's not she's not eyeballing the presidency and we're not we're going to talk about bill okay not today well, no, Bill Clinton got that. himself in the news with the uh, no, you won't. logs. <laughs> we, we don't want our second show oh, to be yes 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 oh the, which did not happen we didn't Bill discuss Clinton. that. So, yeah, our, our <laughs> Christmas episode was deleted from YouTube. Uh, you know, um, Regis, Regis uh, was saying some uh, disparaging things about certain certain things. And I had to do a seven question test. I had to take a quiz, pass seven questions from YouTube in order to, you know, uh, get that red flag taken off my record. But I did um, I did successfully answer those questions. And I have a better understanding now of, you know, what we can say and what we can't say. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we're not getting a lot of viewers. So, you know, maybe, you know, around 100 people uh, watch that episode. So, I mean, it's not the it's not the, the end of the world to have something taken down. Like, you know, it's whatever. But um, and it was a really good sermon by by Regis. Yeah, no, I, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, definitely, for that reason. Um, we're hoping to have Regis back for Friday's episode. We were going to do a tribute to John Pilger. And, um, so, so I think that's, that's, uh, everybody's agreed. Uh, Ian, I want you to come back too, if you're okay doing that. Yeah, um, I can do Friday. I so, can do Friday. so we're going to talk about the media specifically and, and John Pilger also specifically because he recently passed. Um, and I think maybe next time, but I'm just going to leave this as a final uh, positive note. Maybe we could discuss the ramifications of BRICS 10, which is now here to stay, ladies and gentlemen. So we have uh, the original BRICS countries, Brazil, uh, South Africa, India, China, Russia. OK, and now we have Egypt. We have Saudi Arabia. We have Iran. Uh, 
we have the United Arab Emirates and we have Ethiopia, pretty much from the Horn of Africa or Middle Asia. We don't have Malays Argentina because who cares? That's a failed state to be made very soon. It's, uh, we missed an embarrassment with that one. But what if you look up these countries? Uh, it's not huge GDP. It's not huge population. There's a lot of oil. There's a lot of lithium. There's a lot of natural resources in these uh, players' hands. And that's basically now BRICS controlled. And don't forget that this year, around 45% of the globe's population is going through elections. A lot of the places, including the US, which is an all-time thing, including Russia. It's it's going to be a very interesting and I think even more historic year than the last one. And maybe we'll talk about that too. I definitely agree with that analysis. And yeah, 2024 is going to be even better. Not so much for uh, the imperialists, but for humanity, uh, better than 2023. Ian, did you have some last thoughts? No, just three strikes and you go to labor camp. That's the new YouTube policy. So strike one is- <laughs> Gulag. It's, it's, yes. It's Democratic hilarious. Gulag. They want to, you know, the, the West still continues to disparage China for its censorship. And China China censors, they do it outright. They're forthright about it. They don't deny it. and. And, and I think censorship is necessary, but who are we going to censor for? Are we going to censor on the side of the working class and and for truth and to keep out the voices that are trying to, you know, destroy and divide societies? Like, I'm for censoring those people, and that's what China does. Um, you know, the idea that we can just have free speech with no person, time, and place restrictions, I don't, I don't agree with. Do you know but, that's not stri strictly true? Uh, I mean, right. it is censorship, but what China has is laws, and you're supposed to obey them if you want to do business in China. And uh, Meta, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, what do you call it? Uh, these places, they said, we're not going to follow those. So China said, all right, fuck off. It, it was it was really that simple. That's why they have Douyin. No, that's, do, yeah. Do, do not let me to, uh, let me, don't, don't let me overstate the case of China's censorship because it's already exaggerated to an uh, unbelievable degree in the West. And, yeah. and what they do is, 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 is sensible and justifiable. Um, and, you know, I, I can't say the same about YouTube. <laughs> Shoot, there goes, the, there goes this show. There goes. We this. have to be careful. That's it. We'll have guidelines for Regis. We'll keep on a tight lease. Okay, guys, uh, see, we'll see you guys back on Friday. Um, thank you for watching, and we will have Regis as well joining us. Uh, see you then.